Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 301. What precludes beginning testosterone replacement? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So the thing that you do in your office is replace hormones for people that have lost as they age. Mm -hmm. And... You do it differently than a lot of the places that are out there. There are there are any number of highly advertised mass market clinics where they they run an operation mill. People in, people mm-hmm. out, people in, mm-hmm. people out. You don't do that. Mm-mm. You've been doing this for how many years? Fifteen. Fifteen years. And in that those fifteen years you've seen literally thousands of patients, mm-hmm. but not tens of thousands of no. patients. Mm-mm. And because I see each one of them to, at least twice time. in the beginning. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and that's the point I want to get to. You, your philosophy of medicine is that you want a relationship with your patients. Mm-hmm. You don't want to look at a computer screen and not at the patient. And mm-hmm. you want to take your time and find out what's going on with them and evaluate what they need and if you provide it, how is it working. So we reduce symptoms Make and solve them problems. Make them healthier. Make them healthier. So sometimes it is incumbent upon you. Somebody gets it in their head from whatever they've heard or read from other conversations. I need to have testosterone replacement. That will solve my problems. Mm-hmm. And they come in to get testosterone. And you have to go through the workup and you have to have the conversation. Mm-hmm. They have to meet with you. And sometimes your decision is, I, you're not ready for testosterone yet, or I can't give you testosterone because it wouldn't be good for you mm-hmm. in this set of circumstances. Mm-hmm. So you were talking about uh, a challenging conversation that you have coming up in the future. Mm-hmm with just such an individual that that on their own is independently determined the solution to all my problems is just get this testosterone replacement that everybody's talking about. And right. I think that's all I need. And so I'm coming in to get it. And so they've done all the paperwork and they're sending in the stuff and you you know Well I I, I want to clarify right. something because okay. I don't even see a patient until I've looked at their history mm-hmm. and looked at their laboratory. Mm -hmm. And if I have questions, then I get a few questions. My staff helps me get a couple other questions answered. And then I decide that I'll make an appointment with them. Okay. If not, I'll send their lab back to them and say, you don't need testosterone yet. Mm -hmm. If they want to have a consult just to talk about their lab, I'll do that. You don't need testosterone yet, but you may need to talk to your doctor about this because it's of concern. Or you can come in and just talk to me about your lab. But I'm not promising to give you testosterone. Right. That's not the goal for you right now. Right. And that saves me uncomfortable situations. Right. One of the co- uncomfortable situations is, you know, people call up, I want an appointment. They come into the doctor and the doctor and the doctor looks at them and they're 18, you mm-hmm. know, and they don't have a genetic defect and they, they haven't had their testicles they removed or- and they, they don't have Kleinfelters. They don't have yeah. some, some reason yeah. And so then they spend the next hour kind of talking you to death, trying to get you to do something you want to do, Mm -hmm. which I don't think is is helpful. And I think it wears me out. So my way of not having those conversations or being talked into something I think is unethical is to, especially in young men, is to just say, this isn't healthy. I don't do this. And I don't see them. Right. So... The next step is this case. The men who kind aren't of, so young. The men that aren't so young, but who have sent me all their information, and it's apparent to me that they might have prostate cancer already. Okay. All, and, all and so ready. The pre-existing condition of prostate cancer. I mean, we, we've done a couple of podcasts on, on prostate mm-hmm. cancer and prostate health, uh, and, and the general summary of opinion is that men, if they live long enough, all of them are going to get prostate cancer. That's what, that it, currently that's the, that's the, the thought, but they'll probably die for other causes. Right. So you won't die have, of that. Right. So you won't. And, and most of them don't. Some do. 
and the prostate cancer or prostate cancer generally comes in two distinct categories, the aggressive and the non-aggressive. Mm -hmm. The non-aggressive can take years and years and years Decades. and years and never really cause you any problems. The aggressive can kill you pretty quick. Right. And so, A, you can't ignore the possibility that you have prostate cancer. So you, you get your PSA tested, you get uh, digital manipulation to find out if there are hard mm -hmm. lumps or anything on your prostate. And then if and it's required, you get a, a biopsy. Then they look at those things and say, no, it's not cancerous. Or yes, there are cancer cells. So that a primary care or your urologist. Right. Yeah, you don't th do those. I don't do those. So the, they would, I mean, I ask men to be seen by their urologist or primary care prior to treating them right. with testosterone. But I do a PSA. So if the PSA is elevated before seeing them, I send them back to their primary or to a urologist right. for a physical exam. And then, so they, both, both specialties can tell whether the prostate's hard. If it's mm -hmm. hard, that's more likely to be cancer. If it has a nodule or a little bump on it, more likely to be cancer. They also um, might do an MRI, which would be uh, an x-ray uh, or a, a type of x-ray to see the prostate, to see if it's really enlarged or see if they can see any dense masses on it. Right. But the the key to deciding whether someone has prostate cancer is to do a biopsy, and it's usually it's done through through the penis mm -hmm. to the prostate, and a little piece of tissue is taken out and sent to pathology. This sometimes isn't painful; it sometimes is painful, but it's a definitive way of finding out if somebody has prostate. They're, they cancer. still get false positives, even with that. They can. Yeah. So, they can. So it's it's. They can get false. But they usually do multiple biopsies. Mm. Then you, you can get right. the, your slides sent to somebody else for second opinion. That helps. So right. so many of these things are, um, th I mean, this is the workup for prostate cancer. Right. So this is the kind of thing that I would ask someone to do before I considered starting them on testosterone. The reason is is not because testosterone causes prostate cancer, because that's just not true. Taking testosterone or having testosterone is not the cause of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. But if you do have prostate cancer, the cells change and they become very sensitive to testosterone mm -hmm. and that can make them grow. So the cells in a cancer, just like breast cancer, are different than the cells in a normal breast the cells in prostate cancer are different than the cells in a normal prostate. So it's not the cause, but it could, especially mostly in the aggressive cancers, cause the cancer to grow quickly. Hmm. So that's what I'm looking at when I'm, I'm, I see somebody who has an elevated pro PSA. Then we go through the steps. Then if they're cleared by their doctor, I get a, I get a letter. So if they're precancerous, if their PSA is in a normal range, they don't have any nodules on their prostate, they're, uh, everything appears to be okay, mm -hmm. then giving them testosterone is not a problem. It's not no. contraindicated. Mm -hmm. But if they are already cancerous, then it is a problem. Because, because those cells that, are, are, abnormal that are abnormal respond abnormally to, to testosterone. The and many of them, not all of them, but many of them can grow from, right. from testosterone. Now, uh, we find that the aggressive tumors are more likely to grow from testosterone. And those are usually in younger men, not always. But it's, it is a very important thing for me to know that I'm doing no harm. Right. I can't... Uh, ethically do harm to a patient who comes to me for help. Well, the Hippocratic Oath. Right. First, do no harm. Right. And in the case of testosterone and men, then I'm not going to treat young men. And the reason you don't treat young men, just FYI, is because if you give men who already are making testosterone, you shut down their own system, and you give them testosterone, which could scar their, their uh, testicles so that they can't have children. So you don't want to give it to them when they're young. Now, I know that there's a lot of lifters and bodybuilders out there that do that. Right. It's not with pure testosterone, which is even worse. Right. And it scars up the testicles, and so it makes many of them infertile. And that's Ch not... Changes their voice, too. They talk very real. 
<laughs> it does. <laughs> so, well, it shuts down their own system of their own process of making testosterone because there is no way, by the way, to give a little testosterone. You don't top off your testosterone like you're topping off your gas tank. Right. When you give a little testosterone to a man, it shuts, it shuts off, off everything. That's currently functioning in his body. Yeah, and it shuts it off the stimulation the, and, and then you have to replace so you stop, all of it. Does their body turn back on? Well, I, I have seen some men mm -hmm. who... I now treat who are rather young who have shut their whole system down and know their their testicles have scarred up right. and they are not coming back and they can't have their own children. Yeah. And I used to find I used to see men in infertility mm -hmm. that would have this and their wives didn't even know they ever took steroids. Right. And so they married somebody who they thought they were going to have children with and they're very very disappointed because it's something that was avoidable. You know that, so I dealt with this problem a long time ago when I was doing infertility. Right. But I now do it from the other standpoint. The man is my patient, mm -hmm. and I am well. He was then too, but I'm trying to help him live a normal life by giving something back to him that he no longer can make. That's different than giving a normal person testosterone to right. make them have extraordinary levels so that they can be because big, that can do harm. Big, ugly lifters, because yeah. I think it's ugly. Yeah. But well. a lot of people think that that's amazing, but it's really not good for you. Nothing that's so abnormal is really good for you. If you, if you want to go, oh, is that good for me? If it's really abnormal, it's probably not. <laughs> so um, in any case, so, the, the, so young men who, have, who ha are making testosterone, uh, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I would turn away in the very for a second, somebody who has uh, a new diagnosis of prostate cancer. Now, there's a chance that after you've had prostate cancer and it has been treated or your prostate's been removed, a lot of the thinking is now that you can give testosterone back to those patients. And that's, that's something different. But a new prostate cancer, that is not something I'm going to toy with and give testosterone well, and to. So there are like three situations. And what you're saying is if, if the second situation, the, the existence of a known cancer or the suspicion of a known cancer, then you don't interfere with testosterone replacement. Mm -hmm. But if they've gotten treatment and they're okay, then, mm -hmm. you, then they come back and mm -hmm. you can give them. Right. right. And that's kind of a new thought that, that mm -hmm. there's several doctors in New York and in Boston who Starting think that that's that. fine because they think it's worse to not have any testosterone. It's worse for the man's health and right. the, and for the prostate. So we're having this conversation because you have a type two situation mm -hmm. that you need to have a conversation about. Well, I think that there's a lot of this going on, mm -hmm. and um, so I have I have a, a gentleman who is not currently my patient, hasn't had testosterone yet, but has um, sent in his blood work and everything, and and uh, had very high PSA, mm -hmm. but he also has some other risk factors. One of his risk factors is that he has a very strong family history, father and grandfather who had prostate cancer. Okay. So that's a bad, not a good sign. Right. He, I sent him to the urologist. I got a letter back sa stating that he also has an enlarged prostate with a nodule on it. That's not right. a good sign. The repeat PSA went up. That's not a good sign. He's 50 or younger. That means it's more likely to be aggressive and to be deadly. Mm -hmm. That's not a good sign. And um, he has refused any kind of evaluation. Any kind of exploratory? MRI or biopsy. Wow. Anything. So, he, and he's, he's, he's told me that he wants, or he's told my staff, that he wants testosterone anyway. Mm -hmm. He'll sign anything. He'll sign off on it. He'll. That's not the point. Because the way the picture looks to me, and I could be wrong. I could be proven wrong. He, he may not have prostate cancer. But, but you have to eliminate it to know. I have to eliminate that before I would ever treat somebody. Right. And I have to not take his word for it. Right. Uh, I, and this happens in other things, but but which I'll I'll relate to as well. But in this case, 
I do not want to cause his death. Right. Because if he has prostate can- cancer that is aggressive and is growing, then the last thing I want to do is make it grow faster. And right. he needs treatment. Besides that, he needs treatment. So my thought is... I can't, I can't make his decision for him and no one can force him into this, but I can certainly not help him get well, worse. But sometimes as a physician, you have to have a life and death conversation with somebody. Oh, I, have, I have. Your life hangs in the balance of what we decide today or what we decide about your treatment. It could impact your ability to stay alive. I've had the, I mean, I've had a lifetime have. of having those conversations right. with women, Right. but it's a little different. Yeah. You know, I mean, they think about their children and they think about, you know, other things, but men tend to be solitary and think only really about what's going to happen to them to them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go farther than that. So I think it. so in my my jobs to tell him that there are other people that are depending on him that need to be involved in this conversation. You know, we had a conversation about this as a therapist. My approach is to always say there's an elephant in the room. Look, this is what it looks like. And so my suggestion to Dr. Moppin was, you need to say, I've got all this data that makes me very suspicious that you have a cancer. And if you do, and you don't treat it, and you don't deal with it, and you scurry around and try to get testosterone from some, some place that's not as legitimate as I am about doing it, you'll die. So I want to prevent that from happening, and I want you to listen to me. I want you to go and get a biopsy. I want you to go and get check to see an MRI. I mean, MRI is not invasive. You just lie there and they take a picture of it, but he's, he's in denial. He's he's this is a denial situation. And my advice is very uncomfortable for her because she always dances around it in the nicest way possible, but still like a dog with a bone, she'll get there. Uh, I don't like confrontation and I don't like confrontation with really bad news because it's but it, ignoring it, it, it is even worse. News. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to ignore it. This no, no, is not uh, it. He, he is. He, he's ignoring it. Right. But I mean, but I could talk to somebody for an hour, and they could leave and never say another word to anybody, and not do what I say. Right. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. And that does happen all the time. But I. But all I can control is what I will do and what I will not do. Right. And what you will or won't say. Right. And so, I, I mean, I. I have. My my plan is to is to confront him with this, but I'd like to have his wife present. And I'm not sure exactly how to get her there without making this a big, big deal. She's one of my patients as well. So you don't think she'll come with him when he comes. She might, she probably will. Cause he comes with her. Right. Cause I know him. Yeah. And I also know that he's strong willed. And I also know that he doesn't like medicine at all. <laughs> Well, He's not a fan of medical treatments, and I understand that, too. And that, that's not uncommon. Mm-hmm. But what is important about our conversation today is the opportunity for you to, to, to make the case that you don't just provide testosterone to anybody that walks in the door. You don't just give it to somebody because they want it. It has to be a medically justified need and one that in the most identifiable parameters is safe and safely provided. And sometimes that requires that you have a sort of a head to head conversation with somebody that's stubborn or in denial or Mm -hmm. resistant to say, okay, you make your own decisions and you do what you're going to do. But I'm here to tell you as a physician that cares about you, you are at risk and I will not contribute to that risk by giving you something you don't need or that will be harmful for you. And once again, he's reading Morgan Taylor's book. Good. But he's reading it in a way that supports That's his opinion. Testosterone that for testo- Life. Testosterone for Life is Morgan and Taylor's book, and it's a great book. But but he's reading it such that testosterone doesn't cause cancer. Right. Okay, it doesn't right. cause but it. That's not the question. The question that's is, not the do question. you have cancer? Does it stimulate it, which he's, he says in his book is very clear there, but you may not choose to... To mem- remember well, we that. all have a tendency to read it for what we want to get out. We always do. We always do. Right. Every every human does. Right. But I, but my my thought is like that most men are very proactive about like their homes. Okay. Say say their say their home is uh they've gotten they've got some cracks in the foundation and they got a, an expert out to look at it. Yeah. And the expert says. Your house is within a month of falling down. 
if you don't have this foundation right. reinforced. Right. And these are the cracks. They're going to get worse. That, that's it. You know, yeah. so you have to have this fixed or the entire house is going to go. Right. So, which is all, all of what I know about what's going on with him and his house might crash, which is his body. So, so tell, telling him what would you do or asking him, what would you do in this circumstance? If somebody told you for sure, this is is going to happen unless you do something. And the something is evaluation and, if necessary, treatment. So, A, if you go to somebody and they tell you for sure. But, B, if you just bury your head in the sand like an ostrich and don't go to anybody. The house is falling. The house is going to come down. And that's the situation. And just think how, how pissed off your wife would be if you don't tell her about that and the house falls in. Depends See? On, depends on your insurance level. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. If your life insurance is there, but you know, that's, you know, that is something that I don't know. No, and you shouldn't. And I shouldn't know. But the, bo the bottom line is I wish men were as proactive about their health as they are about their that's homes. So many other things, right. And about their car or about their business because they can see that. But, you know, if you tell them something's going on with their well, health, they don't always go out and do it. And your hope continues to be that when you sit down across the table from somebody and, and have a face-to-face -face interview and talk to them, they will hear you because you know that this guy has been resistant to hearing it from other sources and other ways. And so this is your opportunity to say to him, I care about you. I want you I to I love this to be guy. Healthy. He's an amazing guy. And I hate this. You need to do these things. <laughs> and, and so that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is because of all those things, I will not give you testosterone until we know. That's right. And, and if he gets so, cleared by his urologist, we have this conversation for no reason. Except that it's important periodically to solidify your views and your values and to communicate them to people. And we, we do these podcasts every week, and we want people to know that this is your approach to doing medicine. This is why it's important not to go to one of those high-volume clinics where you're just cattle in the chute. This is important that you go to a physician that knows you, takes the time to talk to you, understands your circumstances. Worries about you for a week before she has to talk to you. <laughs> at, at least a week. <laughs> at least a week. You know, trying to, to trying to figure out the best way into this conversation is the hardest right. part. Right. So, so, and I have, you know, this isn't the only problem we have. I have a, I have a gentleman who has become a worse and worse diabetic and refuses to see a doctor, right. other doctor. And I don't take care of severe diabetes. And he, and so I'm, I'm going to tell, I have to tell him I'm not taking care of him anymore for his hormones. If he won't see his, see somebody for his diabetes, I'm right. done. Right. I'm done. It's just like, I, I'm putting the line in the sand. Well, it's like trying to, put out, trying to put out a house fire with a Dixie cup full of water. You know, you can keep yeah. throwing something at it, but if, if the flames are raging, it's going mean, to burn up anyway. It's, it's bad enough that he could die. Yeah. So I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to have to have that conversation with him. That, that gentleman too. And I like him too. It's just a horrible conversation to have. To, to, it's a manipulative conversation to make them go do what they need to do. But it's also it's an it, it's an honest it takes, conversation. It takes courage it's to not have manipulative to manipulative if it's honest value based medicine, and that is your judgment as a professional. That's what you have to communicate. That's true. That's so true. at the end of the day, see, I get not, counseling for free. So she brings in a high dollar therapist to help you with this. Yes, thing. I do. I do. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in any folks. case. That's that we want you to know that not only not only this is how we do we practice medicine, but this is, I think, how medicine should be practiced. Right. And it is something that you deserve it is someone to confront you lovingly with information that they don't want to even tell you, but they have to. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.